Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today, I decided to check back in and see what good old Matty P has been up to. Now, if you don't know who I'm talking about when I say Matty P, hi, welcome to the channel. I'm Vice Rhino, it's nice to meet you, you must be new here. And I'm so sorry, but you are now going to be aware of the human incarnation of a teenage boy's special crusty sock that is Matt Powell. You have my sincerest condolences for that. Also, fair warning, I do go harder against Matt than I do most people, because ordinarily I start with the assumption that whoever I'm responding to honestly believes what they are saying, so I lean more towards gentle correction than chastisement. Well, usually when they start attacking people because of their identity, I do lose sympathy pretty fast. But in Matt's case, there's not only a bunch of evidence that he's a liar who is fully aware of his lies, there's also evidence of him being emotionally abusive and manipulative. So I start his videos already with zero sympathy. Anyway, he recently put out a video titled Christianity Defeats Atheism, and it's always a bit of a laugh when Matt tries to reason out anything to do with atheism. Also, he plays a couple segments from a couple different Nat Geo documentaries about the Big Bang. I'll be skipping them and maybe coming back to them to play the relevant parts if he directly references them. I haven't watched through the whole video yet, but so far it seems like he doesn't talk about them, they're just filler. So let's take a look! First off, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. But we're supposed to believe that in a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, the universe went from smaller than a period on a page to something billions of miles across? Yes, that's the inflationary period. The statement, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, applies to things moving through space, not the expansion of space itself. The expansion of space has no such limitation. As far as we can tell, there is no upper speed limit on the expansion of space. Now, keep in mind that when we say the speed of light is the cosmic speed limit and that nothing can go faster than it, that's a description of how the universe appears to work. If we one day find an exception to that rule, then we will adjust the description of the universe to accommodate that exception. But the formulation of that rule itself, again, only applies to the motion of stuff through space, not the expansion of space. In fact, this fact is why our observable universe is larger than just 13.7 billion light years. If our universe was not expanding, then we wouldn't be able to see anything farther than 13.7 billion light years away, for the simple reason that there hadn't been enough time for the light from those distant objects to have reached us. But make the space in between the stars expand, and since light travels through a vacuum at the same speed regardless of the frame of reference, the light waves have to stretch out to accommodate this larger distance that it finds itself in. This gives all of the light a longer wavelength than a phenomenon known as redshift. Think of it like a balloon, with a bunch of dots drawn on it and some wavy lines in between the dots. It's actually surprisingly hard to uh, draw on a flat balloon, so that pair of tits there is actually supposed to be light waves. When you blow up the balloon, the dots all move away from each other, no matter which dot we choose as our frame of reference. And apparently they disappear because the marker was not really working. Anyway, no matter which dot we choose as our frame of reference, it will look like all of the other dots are moving farther away from it. And the wavy line, or my nice little pair of tits there that was between it, now has a longer wavelength. You can actually still kind of see that even though the marker crapped out. Uh, because of this, we have an observable universe that is about 46 billion light years across. Now, one thing that all of this means, though, is that when we factor in the redshift, we have directly observed photons that have been traveling through space for over 13 billion years, meaning that the universe cannot be a mere 6,000 years old, unless you believe that God is a trickster god that wants to make things look older than they are. That is trillions of times faster than the speed of light. I uh, don't feel like getting into the math on this one to see if he's right, but yeah, it was faster than the speed of light. I expect Matt is probably off by an order of magnitude or three in one direction or the other, but I base that expectation on previous experience which tells me that Matt is always wrong about everything rather than actually running the numbers. Because ultimately this doesn't actually matter all that much. 326 million trillion gallons of water exist on Earth alone. And so to say that all of those gallons of water were compressed down to an infinitesimal amount of space smaller than a single proton? Anybody who believes that, it just goes to show they don't even understand what basic scientific law even is. Because it doesn't take a genius to figure out 
that water can only be compressed past a certain point. In fact, it can hardly be compressed at all. Okay, it's time for me to confess. This is about as far as I went into the video, and this is actually why I chose this one. I'm going to do a science to show how idiotic Matt is being right now, and it's going to involve fire. Okay, for this experiment, we'll need a jug of water, cheap ass power supply that I hope doesn't explode, alligator clips, my fancy dancy electrodes, some tubing, a bowl of soapy water, electrolytes, because that's what plants crave, and fire. Yeah, splash that water all over my cheap ass power supply. Several experimental revisions later. So yeah, that wasn't as impressive as I was hoping for, but we did see a nice little pop at the end there as it uh, ignited the hydrogen. So that was fun. Okay, so what we saw there was one of the processes by which water can be broken down into its molecular components, hydrogen and oxygen. Now, Matt, it may surprise you to know that hydrogen and oxygen, as gases, are quite a bit more compressible than water. Of course, they won't compress down into the singularity just by squishing them together either, but this experiment does serve to demonstrate the absurdity of Matt's point here. Water doesn't always stay water. It can be broken down into its constituent parts, and those parts can also be broken down. So there was not compressed water in the singularity. Likewise, there also wasn't compressed hydrogen or oxygen gases. But this is where Einstein comes in. Remember that E equals mc squared thing? The energy of matter is equal to its mass times the speed of light squared. The result of this is that matter can be converted into energy, and energy can be converted into matter. It's how the sun works. It's how nuclear reactors work. It's how atomic bombs work. Okay, no, that's oversimplifying things. It's not how they all work per se, but it is a necessary part of how they work. My point is, matter can be thought of as frozen energy. Matter would not have existed at the moment of the Big Bang. As such, any matter that you can think that would be ridiculous to compress into the small point of the initial singularity absolutely would not be able to compress down that far. And as such, nobody says that it did. Except Matt. Matt says there was water in it. But the initial singularity would have basically just contained all of the energy and space-time of the universe. But also, singularities are a bit tricky when it comes to physics. There are actually some questions as to whether or not they even exist in the first place. They appear in our models when the property of something approaches infinity. So in the case of black holes, for instance, that's infinite density. But is their density actually infinite? Or does our model of how they work break down when it gets to these types of scales? Most likely, the problem is with our model. Which is why scientists are working on new models, like quantum gravity, which will fill in when relativity breaks down. And so, interestingly enough, NASA has also stated that even though the Big Bang Theory has been widely accepted, it will probably never be proven. Yeah, I'm trying to hunt down the source for that quote, because NASA isn't some guy who gets on camera and says shit. It's an organization full of people. So far, I've found a slideshow by some guy named August Henry, who doesn't attribute the quote to anyone, stating it as though it's original to him, and I can't find anyone named August Henry at NASA, though there is a Henry August who works for Hughes Missile Systems and publishes papers relating to torpedo design that are published in the SAO slash NASA Astrophysics Data System. Seems a bit obscure to be speaking on behalf of all of NASA, so probably not him. Then there's online notes from the SIO35 course from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, uploaded by user vick 94 in which this quote seems to be a part of lecture notes from a course taught by geophysicist Neil Driscoll, who doesn't seem to have anything to do with NASA or cosmology. Seems a bit odd to me to be getting into Big Bang cosmology in an oceanography course taught by a geophysicist who usually specializes in the seafloor, but hey, I'm not an oceanographer, I'm sure he has his reasons. There's also a Google Answers forum post from 2005 by a user by the name of Tufaru-GA that has this quote attributed to NASA, and even has a link. Unfortunately, that link is down, and the Wayback Machine was unable to find it, so as close as we were there, we still didn't learn who actually said this. And there's a handful of other places with this quote as well, most of which include the paragraph before it, pretty much word for word identical to the paragraph preceding it in the lecture notes and all of them being posted by just random users who I can't find any information on. So I'm not saying that nobody at NASA ever said that, 
but we don't know who said it, in what context, and for what reason. I'm not just going to throw out the entire Big Bang Theory because an anonymous person who maybe was affiliated with NASA might have said that it'll never be proven. Also, obligatory clarification that when speaking scientifically, we're not really looking for proof. Nothing can be 100% proven, but it can be 100% disproven. Like Noah's Flood, for instance. There is enough evidence against Noah's Flood from so many different independent fields of scientific research that I'm comfortable saying that science has proven 100% that Noah's Flood did not happen, at least not on a global scale. The story probably was based on a pretty devastating local flood, but that's not exactly what creationists want us to believe about the flood. So even NASA admits that the Big Bang Theory, which they all believe in, will probably never be proven. No, NASA doesn't admit that. At best, one guy might have written that in an article that was probably vastly oversimplifying things in order to be understood by lay people. Do you know why? Because it's not provable, because it's not science, because it's not true. Yeah, no, that's not how science works. Science is more about falsification than proof. It's not what evidence or data would prove the theory to be 100% correct, it's what evidence or data would disprove this theory, either in part or in whole. And then we go looking for that data. If we find it, and assuming sufficient replication of the results to be confident that they will hold, then that part of the theory is now proven false, or maybe even the whole thing, depending on what we're looking at. At which point, scientists will look for a new explanation for the data, and then articulate what would prove this new explanation wrong. Then as time goes on, the explanations get harder and harder to prove wrong, until we get to a point where the likelihood of finding something that will prove it wrong is so insignificant that we can reasonably conclude that we have arrived at the correct theory. For instance, heliocentrism. It'd take a hell of a lot to prove it wrong at this point. We'd probably have to rewrite all of physics to account for the appearance of heliocentrism. It's safe to say that we're probably not as wrong about everything as we would need to be in order for that to be the case, especially given how well our current models of physics work in explaining everything that they explain. So it's reasonable to conclude that heliocentrism is effectively proven. If we take this NASA quote at face value, and assuming you're not quote mining, well, I don't see anything wrong with quote mining. We can take it to mean that the Big Bang will never be as close to being what we might consider proven as something like heliocentrism. But it does have a lot of data on its side, and the Big Bang model has made a lot of predictions that ended up coming true, like the existence of the cosmic microwave background radiation, for example. It's indefensible on every level, and that's exactly why they said that it will probably never be proven. I like how you claim to know exactly why somebody said something, when you don't even know who it was who said it. And they even went on to say that consequentially, this leaves people with a number of tough and unanswered questions. All right, we know what's coming here. We all know that when an apologist sees an unanswered question, the answer is always God. I couldn't come up with a more blatant argument from ignorance if I tried. So people will continuously come to me on the internet and beg me for answers about the Bible and beg me for answers about why Christianity is true. Well, I mean, going to Matt was their first mistake. The second mistake is asking for reasons that Christianity is true. If you start at Christianity, then that suggests an unwillingness to accept an answer that is not Christianity. How about starting with the question, what religion, if any, is true, and then see where you go from there? I wound up learning that there's no good reason to believe in the Christian God, and found that most of the objections were close to universally applicable for other gods as well, so I do not have sufficient reason to believe in God. But the real unanswered questions, the unanswerable questions, are within the Big Bang cosmological model itself. Now, there might well be unanswerable questions about the origin of the universe. It's possible that we will never figure it out with a sufficient degree of certainty to stop hedging about the various models when we talk about them. But that doesn't mean that the answer is automatically God. And God's not even an answer. You don't know any more about the origin of the universe by saying God did it than we do by proposing mathematical models. In fact, I'd wager that giving up and saying God did it would leave us with less knowledge about the origin of the universe than if we, you know, kept studying the origin of the universe. But let's say that God did do it. Why should we stop there? Should we not now investigate how he did it? Apologists often love to bring up the fact that scientists of yesteryear saw their scientific inquiry as a way to discover more about God's creation and how God did his creating. If scientists today had the same attitude, 
we'd still be in the same place knowledge-wise. The evidence points to the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago, with several plausible models that explain what happened just before the Big Bang. The only difference is that the scientists figuring that out would be framing it as the method that God used to create the universe. That's all. It has failed at the scientific method. It is non-repeatable. The event itself does not need to be repeatable in order to be scientifically verifiable. It's that the experiments, observations, and calculations that have led scientists to that conclusion can be repeated. You can do that. Set up sufficient equipment and you can take a picture of the cosmic microwave background radiation. Set up a precise enough laser interferometer and you can detect gravitational waves. Learn some math and you can perform the same calculations that Georges Lemaitre did when he first proposed the Big Bang Theory to see if they hold up. Remember, in order for something to be science, it has to be demonstrable, testable, and repeatable. I mean, I certainly remember your dad saying that in your little movie from a few years ago. Science has to meet three criteria. It has to be demonstrable has to be testable, and it has to be provable. Oh, wow. It's been three years since Science Falsy So-Called came out, and Matt successfully moved in with Kent Hovind onto his creepy compound that has been plagued with rumors of missing children and, well, not to mention the kid who actually drowned in his lake, to which Kent's response was, kids do dumb things once in a while, and the dad's thrilled with the ministry. You know what? It's on video. Just listen to Kent say it for himself. One idiot was talking about, uh, we had the boy drowned at our lake, you know, and uh, the dad was right there by him, you know, seven year old, and uh, we did everything did possible. He just hit his head and disappeared under the water. Nobody saw him. Nobody's fault, just an accident. And so I texted him. I said, You realize 21 people drowned, 31 people drowned in the panhandle of Florida so far this year? Yeah. What are you going to do? Put a fence around the ocean? Mm. Come on. It just happens. You try to avoid all that stuff, but. <laughs> What do you do? You know, kids do dumb things once in a while, and the dad's thrilled with the ministry, wants to come back, going to support us and all that, so tell the skeptics to shut up. So, glad to see Matt's doing well for himself. There's no way that we could repeat the Big Bang cosmologically. Nope, you can't. But if you have access to the appropriate equipment, the appropriate equipment in this case being a microwave telescope, you can observe the cosmic microwave background radiation, or CMBR. The CMBR was predicted to exist nearly 20 years before it was observed, and that prediction came right out of the Big Bang Theory. And you can repeat that observation anytime you like. And that is just one of many lines of evidence for the Big Bang that is fully demonstrable, testable, and repeatable, and thus, even by your terrible definition of what makes something science, it's science. That means that it is not science, it is a religion that people believe in, that people put their trust in. The fact that you keep going on about how things that you don't like are religions suggests that you are fully aware that there is a different level of evidence required for something to be considered scientific that your religion is completely incapable of meeting. The difference, of course, is that the Big Bang does meet that level of evidence because, again, we don't need to repeat the actual event itself in order for it to be science. See, the Big Bang actually states that out of nothing, everything was produced by nothing. Before the Big Bang. There was nothing. Literally nothing. Well, no, not really. If you actually read some of the scientific literature on the Big Bang instead of relying on documentaries, you'd know that this is an incorrect statement. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. I have plenty of other videos that go into the various cosmological models that deal with the pre-Big Bang period, and only one of them has anything to do with nothing. I wasn't in the writer's room for that documentary, so I can't say what they were thinking, but if I were to hazard a guess, I'd say that they were happy with the simplification if it kept things moving and was easy to understand without being too wrong. But yeah, the Nat Geo documentary doesn't hit the same level of scientific rigor as actual peer-reviewed papers. Fancy that. But there was no cause in the beginning. If you take an atheistic perspective of it... Hold up a sec. Who said anything about there being no cause? And why are you talking about the atheistic perspective with regards to a documentary that doesn't have anything to do with God? You're creating a dichotomy here where there are actually a plethora of options. That's called a false dichotomy. That would mean that nothing caused the explosion of time, space, and matter. Or the big bounce happened, or the universe had no initial boundaries in space-time, or the arrow of time as we perceive it reversed at a point in the past, which then looks like the beginning of everything when we look back on it, but effectively makes it eternal, or any number of other models. Read up on some cosmology, my dude. You are several decades out of date here. At least according to theistic evolution, they believe that there was something there that caused the expansion 
of time, space, and nature, something that caused everything to come into existence via an explosion. Well, theistic evolution would be specifically about evolution, I would think, not cosmology. But yeah, the people who believe in theistic evolution are generally more friendly to science, and so they probably accept the scientific consensus on the origin of the universe, but credit God with the initial creative moment. So that's a little more rational than nobody causing an explosion that created time, space, and nature. Not really. Given the current state of the evidence, Occam's razor would have us discard the God hypothesis. It provides no new information and ends up just needing extra explanations. This doesn't automatically mean that the God hypothesis is wrong, just that it's not necessary in order to explain the universe. And so if you take an atheistic perspective of the Big Bang, you're actually taking a mystical and magical approach to understanding the universe. I know you like to do that because you think it's clever to take phrases that atheists often throw in your direction when you're advocating for, well, literal magic and then turn it back on them. But you can't just say that and have it be true because you said it. The atheistic approach, which should more properly be called the naturalistic approach, as there are plenty of scientists who believe in God and still hold to naturalism when sciencing it up, simply doesn't assume explanations for which there is no evidence. Specific to cosmology, it's pretty much all about the math. The math describes physics. Now, can we make mathematical models that work for the pre-Big Bang period? Yes, we can. And there are several different approaches that could work. You can even run the math on them yourself if you like, though I don't have much confidence in your mathematical prowess, so I wouldn't be inclined to trust your results. Not that mine would be much better, I'm not good at the math either. It is magic to say that something just created itself from nothing. And since that's not what is being said, it's not magic. Yet that's the very thing that atheists believe. No, it really isn't. You can tell me that I believe it all you want, but that doesn't make you right. And I know you watch my videos, I've seen you comment, and then sheepishly delete your comments when people start noticing them. You have heard me say this before. Update your arguments to include cosmological models that aren't just the one single one that superficially sounds like one you think you have your best shot arguing against. Even with that one model, its main proponent disagrees with you about what nothing is. That nothing would have been an eternal, empty void, namely empty space. But once I argue that empty space can create something, then immediately I'm told that's not nothing. Yeah. And then, and then I show that, em that space itself can be created from nothing, and then I'm told that's not nothing. And then I say, well, and because there are still laws of physics. And then I argue that, in fact, the laws of physics, for the reasons we've discussed, the anthropic principle, there may be many universes, and it's quite likely that even the laws of physics themselves arose by accident when the universe was created. So even the laws aren't there. And I'm told that's not nothing. And, and the definition of theologians, I think, for nothing is that from which only God can create something. So again, Matt, I would ask that you update your knowledge of cosmology to include more than just this one model that you don't even partially understand to begin with. You just reject it because it doesn't feel intuitive to you. Well, I got news for you. There is plenty of stuff in science that is counterintuitive, and yet is still true. The whole speed of light in a vacuum thing is one of them. Like, you know how if you're in a car traveling at 100 kilometers per hour and you throw a ball toward the front of the car at, let's say, 5 kilometers an hour just to keep it simple? Someone outside the car will see that ball traveling at 105 kilometers per hour. Well, that's not how light works. Everyone will see light traveling at the same speed, regardless of their frame of reference. That's why time gets wonky as you approach the speed of light. The equation speed equals distance over time has to stretch time out in order to keep the speed the same. If you are going close to the speed of light, in order for light to travel away from you at the speed of light relative to you, your time has to slow down a lot in order to make the equation work and simultaneously make it so that an observer from a stationary reference point will also see the light traveling at the speed of light rather than at the speed of light plus whatever speed you are traveling at. That's not even a little bit intuitive, and that's one of the easier bits of general relativity to understand. And I've grossly oversimplified it and made it sound like the speed equals distance over time equation is prescriptive rather than descriptive, which is just not the case. It's just the most intuitive way I can think of to explain this counterintuitive fact of the universe. My point is, intuition is not helpful in science. Now I know a lot of people say that they believe in science, and they believe that there's no God, and that they're skeptics. But a true skeptic is somebody that's actually skeptical of demonstrated lies that have been told to them. <laughs> you really out here trying to know true Scotsman the word skeptic? 
Well, if we want to get pedantic, there are several definitions of the word skeptic, so maybe for one of those definitions you're right. He's not. The definition that fits most closely with how I use the word is, well, they define skeptic as someone who adheres to skepticism, so it's actually a definition of skepticism. And it's the method of suspended judgment, systematic doubt, or criticism characteristic of skeptics. Skepticism is a methodology by which judgment is suspended until sufficient evidence is provided for a claim. You said that a true skeptic is someone who is skeptical of demonstrated lies that someone has told them. That's a really weird definition. If a statement has been sufficiently demonstrated to be a lie, then yeah, the application of skepticism would have you stop believing the lie if you had previously believed it. But I'm more interested in what comes before the demonstration that it was a lie. Was there sufficient evidence to make belief in this lie reasonable, and then new information came to light that changed this fact? If not, then the true skeptic would actually have not believed it in the first place. They would have withheld judgment on the grounds of insufficient evidence. In which case, upon discovering the evidence that the statement was in fact a lie, they would be vindicated in their withholding of judgment. Now, all that said, who fucking cares about the definition of skeptic in this hypothetical, or whether someone was a true skeptic beforehand? The problem is that the thing that he's calling a demonstrated lie is that the universe came from nothing, but he's basing his assessment of the falsehood of that statement entirely on how he intuitively feels about the subject matter. That runs counter to the practice of skepticism. We know that intuitions are often wrong, so basing important decisions and beliefs on nothing but intuition is likely not the best option. Skeptics fight with themselves regularly because intuitions can be incredibly strong at times, and it can often take a tremendous amount of effort to resist deciding things based on intuition. Also, necessary pedantic caveat time. Life is too short to be hyper-skeptical about everything, so like, if someone tells me that they got a dog, I'm not going to demand evidence. Well, I probably will demand to see pictures, but not because I don't believe them, just because dogs are cute. I mean, here's puddles. She's not mine, but I'm working on stealing her, because she is so fucking adorable. Now, do you require evidence that I puppy sit her once or twice a week? No, because that's a mundane claim, and whether you believe it or not will make no difference to either of our lives. Being skeptical of such a claim would be a complete waste of mental resources. Lies such as the Big Bang cosmological model, something that we know could not have happened, something that we know is not true, objectively. Quite the contrary. We know that it could plausibly have happened. Actually, as far as the Big Bang in isolation is concerned, we pretty much know that it did happen. But as usual, Matt is conflating the Big Bang with the Universe from Nothing cosmology, which is only one of many plausible cosmological models. I mean, we're actually dealing with a crowd of people that believes in flat-out magic. But of course, they will spew their own confusion with themselves onto the Christians. They will accuse us of believing in mysticism and magic when in reality, they're the ones who believe in superstition and a magical imaginary process that we've never observed and that we never will observe because it's not science, because it's not true. Buddy, you have a holy book that literally tells you to watch out for people who do magic. Do not suffer a witch to live. Don't use enchantment. Anyone who has a familiar spirit or is a wizard shall be put to death. There shall be none among you who use divination or are an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a wizard or a necromancer. Why would there be so many warnings against such people if magic weren't real? I mean, in your worldview. I obviously don't think there's a problem with any of those people because, like, the magic doesn't happen. It's not a real thing. But, like, I mean... Back to your book, King Saul consulted a witch in order to summon the spirit of the deceased prophet Samuel, and it worked for him. In the Ten Plagues of Egypt story of Exodus, there are magicians who mimic the plagues, though to a less impressive degree. There's no hint that these magicians are merely faking the tricks that Moses is doing for real. The text simply has them repeat the trick themselves, at least for the first couple of plagues. They gave up after the lice. But they succeeded in turning a staff into a snake, turning water into blood, and summoning frogs. And that's not to mention that miracles are literal magic. They just get the word miracle instead of magic because when people hear the word magic, they associate it with stage magicians who accomplish their tricks through misdirection rather than actual magic. But if we turn to the dictionary again, we get a definition of magic of an extraordinary power or influence seemingly from a supernatural source. Would you say that a miracle is an extraordinary power that comes from a supernatural source? Would you say that God creating the universe out of nothing was the result of an extraordinary power from a supernatural source? 
please explain how God operates in a way that doesn't fit perfectly with this definition of magic. Meanwhile, the cosmological models don't posit any supernatural sources for anything. Instead, they stick only to what is plausible given our understanding of the laws of physics. Folks, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And would you perhaps say that God was exerting his extraordinary power, being himself a supernatural source? What do we call that again? It's much more powerful. It's much more scientific. How exactly is God did it more scientific than the actual scientific models? Have you even looked at any of the math that explains how the models work? Do you have any inkling of the method that God used to create the universe? Or does that just get explained away with an appeal to God's mysterious ways, which amounts to an answer of, I don't know how it happened, which then leaves us at the same place we are without God. We don't actually know how the universe ultimately began its existence. The difference here is, you just add an unnecessary God into the equation and take an extra step before getting to I don't know is your answer. Dan, in the beginning, an explosion from an infinitely dense hot point created time, space, and nature and everything that we see today. Remember, according to them, all of the stars, planets, galaxies, and oceans, everything that we see in the universe would have had to have been compacted down into an infinitely dense hot point. Nope, that's just your gross misunderstanding of the idea. And if this infinitely dense hot point exploded, it would only shoot out smaller particles than what was contained in the center. Which is precisely why explosion isn't a great description of what happened at the Big Bang. It was an expansion of space itself, which allowed matter to eventually coalesce, which then allowed for the eventual formation of stars, which formed the heavier elements. Think about it, if you have an explosion from a center point, all you have is little pieces of whatever exploded flying off. I suppose that must be all your simple little brain is capable of comprehending. My condolences. Well, I mean, maybe not. I was about to say that I sincerely wish that he were smarter, but given his lack of a moral compass, I feel like that would just make him more of an effective grifter. So given the option between the laughable and incompetent grifter that he is, or an intelligent and effective grifter, I'd rather he be the laughable and incompetent one. And hey, this is a Matt Powell video, so I have to play the montage at some point. This seems like as good a spot as any, so here it is. But in space, wouldn't it be a different scenario based on the fact that, you know, the, 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 the space and the air in the space is much different than the air we have here. That out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. The dinosaurs they discovered have, uh, the dragons they discovered have chambers in the back of their head. It's where they can breathe fire. But that's just a couple things. I mean, if it's about survival of the fittest and we evolved from African Americans into other Americans, what about the African Americans that are still alive today? Well, I don't see anything wrong with quote mining. I believe if we study history, you know, the Confederates were able to shoot pterodactyls. T-Rex, they had short, stubby arms. And apparently now the chicken's able to do a handstand with those arms. Think about this. We have more in common genetically in certain areas with a gorilla than with an ape. Yet they say, genetically, we evolved from apes. We can tell based on genetics. Honestly, John, I don't know a ton of technical terms. I'm very simple when it comes to science. I, I just enjoy simple science. But according to them, these pieces of energy somehow formed into matter. They morphed themselves into planets, stars, oceans, galaxies, goo to the zoo to you and I. <laughs> that's that's fucking hilarious man okay so first off he is clearly aware that nobody thinks water was in the singularity at the beginning of the big bang he just described how it wasn't even matter it was energy which then coalesced into matter and we know this is possible because of the whole e equals mc squared thing already talked about that not getting into it here again but he's also trying to correct the grammar of that creationist from goo through the zoo to me and you line. And in the process, he completely broke it. It's catchy because it rhymes, Matt. If you change it to you and I, you break the rhyme and it just sounds clunky and awkward. But also, grammatically speaking, me and you is correct here. An easy way to figure out whether something should be you and me or you and I is to remove the you and from the equation. So in the sentence, you and me went to the zoo, if we take out the you and part, me went to the zoo. So there it should be you and I went to the zoo, because that makes more grammatic sense. 
However, if we look at the sentence, Kent went to the zoo with you and me, when we remove you and from that sentence, it still makes sense. Kent went to the zoo with me. So in that case, you and me is grammatically correct. It's about the subject versus the object of the sentence, but that's a decent rule of thumb that'll usually get you there, no problem. And that's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Marcin Swiatko, who says, Yeah, also you would go to hell for suicide. So do it? This is a proud moment for me as a YouTuber. This is my first comment telling me to kill myself, well, at least the first one that I ever recall seeing. And you haven't really made it as a YouTuber until you get one of these. So thank you so much, Marcin. I am now a real YouTuber thanks to you. Thanks for watching, thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, who are the decades of research and modeling that has gone into the cosmologies that are my channel. If you'd like to be completely ignored by apologists because they've latched onto the one model that superficially sounds silly to them, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time! Hi, kitty. I know you want more food, but you have food. You have food. You have food. You have food, my girl. Why are you bothering me? I know you don't love me. You just love that I feed you. Hello.